Welcome to the introductory lecture on migration and health. Today, I'd like to cover a couple of key issues which I think are important underpinnings for the remainder of the course. Um, core issues that I, I hope will help you engage with all of the course materials and the subsequent sessions. Firstly, um, it's about emphasising the fact that migration is a central determinant of health. And we're going to talk about the fact that there is a bi-directional relationship between migration and health. By this, I mean that health can determine migration and migration can determine health status. We're going to cover the fact that migration health is a global public health priority. We're going to talk about that within the contemporary space um, and what that means for current global health targets, um, particularly when we're thinking about the SDGs and universal health care coverage. We're going to focus on the ways in which structural violence in a context of migration negatively affects health. Um, it's important that we ensure that we pay serious attention to the ways in which damaging discourses um, xenophobia, racism, and conflicting agendas, um, particularly in relation to securitization, can affect health of people on the move. And finally, um, to look at opportunities for change. And here I hope to leave you with some thoughts about the different ways in which um, we can collectively work to better understand the field of migration and health in order to generate evidence um, that ultimately we hope will lead to improved responses. Key within that is remembering that health is political, as we all know. Migration is a politically challenging field within which to engage and work. Um, so the field of migration and health together create a very difficult scenario within which to engage with key actors involved in responding to migration and health. So to start with, what are we talking about when we, when we say migration? From the get-go, I think it's really important to emphasise that when I refer to migration, I am referring not only to individuals who've crossed an international border, so somebody we would refer to as an international migrant, but also people who move within their countries of birth. It's really important to recognise that there are around three times more people who move within their countries of birth than there are people who um, are international migrants. We know that 3 to 4% of the global population is an international migrant, and obviously this isn't distributed equally across the globe. Migration can take many different forms. Um, there are many ongoing debates around nomenclature, around categorization, around the use of different typologies of terminologies. What does this mean for developing comparative studies? What does this mean for capturing nuance? When is something a bureaucratic category, a legal category, versus other ways of seeing and understanding experiences of people who move? What's important is that we recognize that these particular framings may have different meanings in lower middle income country contexts versus high income contexts. What is really important here is to recognize the ways in which people are moving. We tend to see the majority of media um, and public discourse focuses on people moving from the in inverted commas south to, to northern context. I'm using those phrases as, as a shorthand here. Um, but this is not the greatest amount of movement. So we focus on people moving from what are considered to be lower middle income country contexts into high income country contexts. But actually the majority of people who are moving are moving within regions of um, low middle income countries. People tend to remain within the region of their birth and move within those spaces. Yet this is rarely considered in the global discourse. We need to be aware that there is this increasing complexity of movements, um, that there are different debates that continue, as I mentioned, around labelling and categorising. And we need to think about what this means for the ways we do research, the ways that we apply our research, and the ways that we respond and act in different um, spaces, whether as, as service providers, whether as bureaucrats, whether as policy makers. So this slide um, further illustrates the point that I was just making when we want to look at the kinds of movement that are taking place. It's important to see here that, for example, within the African continent, we have around 20 million people moving within the continent. 
We have within Asia around 63 million, the largest population of people on the move within, within the region. We have people who are moving um, from the African continent into Europe, but a far smaller number, 9 million, for example. We have people moving within Europe, which is another very large um, population group on the move within their region of, of birth. So it's important to recognize and remember that international migration is mostly occurring within the same world region, um, but about half of all international migrants remain within their region of birth. So the, the language of international migration, we need to be very careful and cautious about what we are referring to. As I mentioned, the, the focus tends to be on thinking about individuals moving into um, North America, moving into Northern Europe, um, and, and it's important that we, we are far more critical and aware of the, the reality of data around who's moving and in what ways. <coughs> this um, figure from the United Nations um, Refugee Agency, UNHCR, um, just gives a snapshot on the ways in which different groups of international migrants um, are understood in terms of numbers. So the data suggests that we have almost 70 million people who are forcibly displaced. Within that, the majority are people who are displaced within their countries of birth. We then have a proportion of people who are considered refugees. Here this means individuals who have been awarded refugee status. Um, which is a very specific category of individuals. They have sought asylum and have been um, um, given a refugee status, which gives them the legal right to reside in a particular country um, under which that refugee status was, um, was granted. We also have a population of individuals who are in the process of seeking asylum, so are individuals who have asylum claims within which they are hoping to attain um, refugee status. It's important to look, for example, here at the top refugee hosting countries. If we were to focus on popular media reports, we would probably miss um, recognising where the majority of, of refugees are currently hosted. And we see that the majority of refugees are hosted within low middle income country contexts. It's important we recognise this when we look at the disproportionate focus on individuals um, who move into high income country contexts. So what is the field of migration and health? Um, there are four key areas that um, I believe are important. The first is thinking about migrant health, the health of individual migrants, and the impact that migration um, may have on individuals who move. The second thing is about a public health approach, so thinking about the ways in which migration as a process can affect the health of populations. Thirdly, we need to look at systems responses to migration and health. Um, obviously, the health system, a biomedical health system, is central here, um, but a whole-of-government response is needed to develop improved responses that are able to engage with the health of people on the move and consider migration and mobility within systems planning. And finally, we need to look at global governance systems and where global governance um, of migration and health fits within that. So I'm going to take some time now to go through um, some key issues that look in particular at some of the governance frameworks. Um, and from that, we're going to look at some more specific issues. This comes from a, um, a recently published chapter in the 2020 World Migration Report. For the first time, there was a chapter included on migration and health. Um, and this just gives you an idea of how many global um, agendas are intersecting with the field of migration and health. What this is emphasizing and illustrating is that migration is a cross-cutting issue across many health, um, health, health targets, health goals, global health agendas. But equally, the fact that health needs to fit and be more squarely seen and understood as cross-cutting within other spaces. So by example, the global health agenda, whether we're looking at issues from global health security, right through to looking at universal health care coverage, looking at World Health Assembly resolutions that are specific to looking at um, the health needs and health responses required to address the needs of, of refugee and migrant populations. 
We know that it links directly into the sustainable development goals. So when we're thinking about universal health coverage, for example, where does migration fit in there? Are we ensuring no one is left behind? Are we leaving certain groups behind on the basis of their nationality, their citizenship status, their documentation status? We then have a migration governance agenda. This is a space um, globally that is um, becoming increasingly tense. It's a space that um, whilst there is a greater recognition of the need for um, global uh, governance approaches to thinking about the movement of people who cross international borders, we need to be very aware of the fact that this is also um, the result of an increasingly nationalistic society, an increasingly um, xenophobic world where we are seeing um, national borders being increasingly strengthened and further securitized. By that I mean making it harder for individuals to physically but legally and bureaucratically cross international borders. And there are, of course, within that direct impacts on health and well-being. Importantly, there are other there are certain initiatives that I'm going to talk to just now that have been developed as attempts to shine a light on the fact that we need to be better engaging with health in these in these contexts. So in 2008, the World Health Assembly um, passed a resolution on the health of migrants. Um, this was an important moment because it provided a strong advocacy tool for um, mobilizing and holding states accountable for their responses to, to the health of people on the move. This was in 2008, um, and a framework was developed around four priority areas. Firstly, looking at monitoring migrant health. Secondly, looking at partnerships and networks that are required in responding to migration and health. The development of migrant sensitive health systems um, and policy and legal frameworks. What's important here is that there's a very clear focus on the language of the individual migrant. Um, migrant sensitive health systems, for example, where we're looking at cultural competency and issues like that. Um, but at this stage, we're not effectively bringing in the language of migration and mobility. Um, the focus remains on the individual who moves, which of course is key, but our systems need to be able to respond to movement um, in, in many different ways. 2010 saw the first global consultation um, on the health of migrants. It was a stock-taking exercise to look at what progress had been made since the 2008 um, World Health Assembly resolution. In 2017, we see the second global consultation taking place. Um, so this is now almost 10 years after the um, initial resolution was, um, was granted by the, the World Health Assembly. And here we are um, in a space where we're looking at whether or not we need to reset the agenda and in what way to think about the health of migrants um, and peoples on the move in, in, in a global context. The meeting took place in Sri Lanka in Colombo and a um, statement was presented um, from ministers and government representatives who were there representing different nation states um, in developing a call for improving responses to migration and health, a, a commitment, a political commitment. Um, from this meeting, a um, research agenda was beginning to be developed. Um, and of course, this is one of many initiatives that have been looking at the field of migration and health, particularly migration and health research. Um, but this, this did come from an attempt at doing some scoping at the global level um, an um, international group of migration and health researchers um, <coughs> from academia, from government, um, from civil society, came together as part of the consultation to really look at what research priorities um, exist, what knowledge do we need in order to provide recommendations for improved responses. Subsequent to the 2017 um, global consultation, a second resolution was passed from the <coughs> sorry, World Health Assembly um, looking at promoting the health of refugees and migrants. Um, what's important here 
is that the um, resolution called for the development of a global action plan on um, the health of refugees and migrants. The end of 2018 saw the adoption of the Global Compact for Migration. The full wording of this compact, which some of you may have heard of, is the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Global compacts are non-binding. They are internationally agreed upon principles. Um, and the resolution here was about developing principles for globally um, for global responses to, to international migration. The common sets of principles relate to a range of different um, um, focus areas. The compact itself comes from um, actions that are required around the sustainable development goals and health is one of the issues that is referred to in the global compact. Many have welcomed the Global Compact as something that looks at the needs and the rights of those on the move. Others are more sceptical, raising concern for the ways in which the Global Compact um, re-emphasises the role of the nation-state and sovereignty when managing um, migration. Of course, migration is implicitly a sovereign issue, but we know that to develop improved global responses to migration and health, we need to think about the ways in which the governance of migration um, may directly impact health and well-being. So there are questions around what that means in terms of the, the resolution. Concurrently, um, a um, compact, the Refugee Compact, the Global Refugee Compact, was also produced um, in this Global Compact on Refugees was looking at ways that um, would also enhance a response to, um, to refugees globally. This is a process that was run by the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN Refugee Agency. And the, um, the compact, again, like the GCM, the Global Compact for Migration, is non-binding, but it is around solidarity, it's around principles, um, and it's around efforts to try and develop common, common principles um, in how we should be responding to the needs of refugees. As mentioned in the 2017 um, World Health Assembly Resolution, um, there was a, a requirement for a draft, well, for a global action plan to promote the health of refugees and migrants to be developed. Um, a draft action plan currently exists, um, and it has highlighted six key priorities. This is being coordinated by the World Health Organization in collaboration with the International Organization for Migration and the UNHCR. So here we have six key um, recommendations. There are questions being raised by some about the effectiveness of such a plan. Is it, is it calling for sufficient action? Who's driving the global agenda? Um, <coughs> really becoming an example of the complex um, intersections between international migration and, and health. As I mentioned earlier, um, the 2020 World Migration Report saw for the first time um, a chapter dedicated to migration and health. It's important to recognise this. Um, health has often been um, kept on the sidelines of international migration um, discourse and action um, and finding ways to support mainstreaming into the migration governance world, into the world of international migration um, data and understanding. Um, bringing health into that is, 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 is as important as bringing migration into the health field. All of this is taking place within a world where the global health security agenda is becoming increasingly important. Um, it's an agenda that has a lot of political clout. It is about um, ensuring um, international relations as in, in relation to the ways in which we um, address potential health threats. Um, it's looking at avoiding catastrophes, detecting threats early. It's about responding rapidly and effectively. It's important to recognise that this is about thinking about um, a range of emerging um, and neglected tropical diseases. It's around looking at new 
diseases. It's around looking at the ways in which um, biological warfare, for example, um, are issues of, of security that um, nation states are developing collaborative measures to explore and respond to. We have to be aware that sometimes the global health security agenda um, may be co-opted by some of those involved in immigration management to justify further securitized approaches. And this is where sometimes public health principles around communicable disease control can come into conflict with um, the ways in which a global health security agenda may be co-opted by those responsible at, at border management levels. So I want to use the second half of the, the lecture of my talk just to look at some of these um, key issues within that, that global context that I've just laid out. There's a lot happening globally. Migration health is increasingly um, being found to see, being given attention, not always in helpful ways. Um, so it's important that we really understand what's happening. As I mentioned, migration is a central determinant of health, and it's important that we recognize that whilst people's movements may determine their health, it's important to know that health can determine migration. So by this, what I mean is that moving may improve your health, moving may worsen your health. And it's important that we remember it can happen in both ways. Often we assume when we talk about migration and health, we're assuming people who move become more unhealthy or people who move are moving in order to seek health care. That is not always the case by far. Um, and many who move do experience improved health outcomes as a result. Health status itself can also then determine migration. In many ways, you have to be healthy in order to migrate. You have to be in, in good health to undertake a journey, to access work, etc. Obviously, there are contexts where this isn't the case. Um, for example, somebody being forced to flee civil war or persecution. But again, it's about thinking about who is, is selected. If we want to look at populations who move, we often see something referred to as a healthy migrant effect, whereby an individual's health status, um, a person who moves tend to have a better health status than the communities they leave behind, and often healthier than the communities to which they arrive. So this positive selection of healthy individuals is something that is often over, um, overlooked when we're looking at um, the political debates that go on around migration and health and the assumption that people who move are always a burden. <clears throat> if we look at the social determinants of health framework, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, it is really apparent that migration isn't listed. Um, we have to remember that the social determinants of health framework came out of a World Health Organization process. Member states are involved in that and, and migration, international migration, is a politically challenging issue. Um, so that compromises are often made on what, what makes it into these frameworks or not. And I think the fact that migration isn't there um, is, is, is something that we need to be very cognizant of. A couple of key issues, particularly when we're thinking about the world of migration, we need to recognise the health system mentioned as an intermediary determinant of health, which it is, um, is more than just the biomedical health system. We need to be clear to make sure that when we're talking about migration and health, we don't fall into the trap of only talking about health systems, but importantly, when we're talking about health systems, that we remember that plural systems exist. Um, this is particularly important in the context of movement, as people will often bring particular health-seeking practices with them, and it's important that systems um, in destination contexts are able to, to respect and respond to that. When we're looking at structural determinants of health inequities, we need to move beyond just thinking about the language of culture and social values. We need to be able to call out xenophobia, racism and nationalism, and the ways in which um, those particular values are um, influencing and informing policy making far more than any, um, any evidence-based policy processes. I would argue that then leads to um, structural violence impacting the health and well-being, um, not only of people on the move, but the populations with whom um, they interact and where they live. 
So we need to be making sure when we're looking at what determines good health and what determines equity in the distribution of, of health and well-being, um, that immigration legislation and health legislation itself, in terms of governance and, and policies, um, is in itself affecting access, it's affecting safety to access, um, and it is in many cases leading to challenges in, in the right to health being upheld. There are further impacts, for example, without documentation or without certain documentation, do individuals have the right to work safely? Do they have access to safe living conditions? Um, are they able to um, live freely within, within the, the, the places that they're living and working? Are their children able to access school? Are they able to access um, safe spaces um, and so forth. And so we need to recognise how all the determinants of health are ultimately framed by these um, structural determinants, um, which include legislative frameworks. It could then be argued when we look at public health as being a justice issue, um, that, that responding to um, equity in health requires really thinking about um, where immigration and the rights of in individuals who move across international borders fits. Um, and in order to improve a justice-driven response, we need to be thinking about all of these factors. Determinants of health can change over time and place. Um, this is, I would anticipate, an obvious issue, but it is something that's often overlooked. We tend to see that the majority of work that explores migration health tend to focus on um, the, what, what could be framed as arrival and integration. So these are the moments and the spaces where individuals who move arrive um, and reside. The result is that we tend to forget to look at what happens before people move, if people return to their original place of origin, and importantly, looking at what happens during journeys. Um, and in this case, um, for example, issues of detention, deportation are often overlooked. And we need to better understand how structural determinants of health are overlaid here. Structural determinants of health are what are going to influence and inform health and well-being of people on the move at different moments during their journeys. So migration and health is a global health priority, and I hope that I've made that case, um, particularly within the context that I laid out at the start of the lecture. Within that, what we need to recognise is that health policy making in a context of migration has very particular patterns. <clears throat> It's either from what we could refer to as a threat-based approach, whereby we prioritise public health um, security, communicable disease control, um, screening and monitoring, so interventions at borders, interventions whereby health is used as a justification for preventing the movement of people. Others will be looking at making health policy from a rights-based response. So this is where we would be looking at the recognition of universal health care, the right to health, um, acknowledging that social exclusion and discrimination um, will present particular health vulnerabilities for certain migrant groups. It's about thinking about medical ethics, duty of care, and who has the right to um, attain health and well-being. So historically, a threat-based approach was leading the ways in which um, individuals were, were governed in a context of migration and health. Today, we know that not all migrant groups are evenly distributed. Um, we need to better engage with the language of population health, public health approaches, and thinking about what that means for health policy and program development. I would argue that a threat-based approach or a rights-based approach individually are insufficient. We need to find ways to bring together um, the, the imperatives implicit in a public health approach to communicable disease control whilst recognising the rights of people on the move. We need to ensure that the right to move and the right to safe travel and transit is not being um, overruled through co-opting a global health security agenda to further securitise international borders. Structural violence, as I mentioned, is key. Um, and in the context of migration, we increasingly see the ways in which structural violence are um, 
is playing out to negatively affect both the, the physical and psychosocial well-being of migrants and, and people on the move. Firstly, if we look at um, damaging discourse, and here I'm, I'm referring to issues around um, the ways in which we talk to each other, the ways in which we talk about um, what this means in terms of the language we use in our research, what language it is that politicians use, that the media uses, um, and our responsibilities to really check that, be thinking about labelling and definitions, thinking about representation. We know that when we often um, see reports around migration and health in popular media, and we see this globally, certain stereotypes and languages around fear, deservingness, um, moral panics are created, an overemphasis often on the language of human trafficking, um, a lack of understanding of the role of people who can broker smuggling, um, and this ways in which securitization borders and containment get used as ways to represent particular issues associated with migration and health. We then need to think about the ways in which um, geopolitical space um, context actually um, influences who has the power to determine what kinds of um, labels and definitions and representations are, are prevalent. And we need to recognise that between low and high income contexts, there is a power play around what issues get heard and what issues make it into um, the global governance agenda. As a result, this can rarefy and overemphasize particular geographical spaces or particular population groups, um, leaving experiences and realities in, in lower income country contexts off the table. As we're all aware, the language of scapegoating is one that is real. We are increasingly seeing the ways in which political leaders um, and government officials are scapegoating non-nationals, foreign migrants, international migrants, um, for failures in their own um, service delivery. This is particularly the case in um, situations where um, public health care systems may be struggling. Um, blame is, um, is easier to um, sell politically than it is to admit to internal challenges around budgeting and management and so forth. We know that not all who move are sick and we know very rarely do people move in order to seek health care, um, particularly not into other public health care systems. So we need to understand what is happening um, to facilitate this discourse being, being driven as a convenient political agenda. So we need to be aware of who's determining this, this kind of agenda around migration and health. Whose voice is loudest? Do we need to think about turning the tables around to ensure that a more rational, reasonable and evidence-informed debate is taking place? So we sit in this moment of competing agendas, as I've been mentioning. The securitization of migration, and as I mentioned, this is about thinking about border management processes, it's about sovereignty, it's about the role of the nation state, being able to regularise and build um, physically and metaphorically stronger borders. We have the global health security agenda, which is of course an important agenda, looking at communicable diseases, epidemic preparedness, looking at um, you know, um, uh, biological warfare and concerns around emerging tropical uh, you know, d diseases and looking at new, new, um, new infections, new infectious diseases. We then, within that, have the language of migration for development. Here it's a focus on looking at migrant workers, migrant labour, the role of remittances for human development, looking at social and economic development. So already we're beginning to see that there potentially are some contradictions. On the one hand, there are states that are trying to um, improve, strengthen the securitization of their border spaces. On the other hand, we know that migration and development are so closely linked. Within that, the global health security agenda is potentially being um, used to manipulate and maneuver around some of those um, discussions, particularly in order to support um, nation states in, in increasing their border management and regularization systems. 
So what does this all mean for universal healthcare coverage? Um, within the UHC 2030 agenda, linked to the Sustainable Development Goals, we are looking to improving health for all. We're looking to ensure that we are leaving no one behind. Um, and there are implications for public health here. If through um, other processes we are restricting the ability of individuals to access um, the healthcare that they require to access preventative health, but importantly, if they are struggling to access positive determinants of health, then we are going to be undoing any attempt to achieve universal healthcare coverage. So there are important lessons um, here and important um, concerns to be raised around the fact that we cannot achieve a universal healthcare coverage agenda if we are not engaging with individuals who move across borders, which requires us to engage with the structural processes that are um, making those processes safe or dangerous, um, which is something that all of us need to be engaging with in terms of that global, global picture. So opportunities for change, what is needed? Can, we, can, can things um, become better? Well, I'd argue that um, we're at a very complicated moment um, in terms of global terrain. We know that the, the politics around migration, around um, health are incredibly complicated, complex, entangled, and we need to find ways to build alliances, to advocate for the need for improved evidence, to improve our responses. Um, we need to work to ensure that we are obtaining the political buy-in that is needed for, for change. So, we know that there's been a renewed focus on migration and health, but we also know we have these competing agendas. So when we're looking at what's needed and opportunities for change, we do have to be putting all of these issues together. We need to think about what security means. We need to think about how to address these issues. So what is needed? I argue that we need to advocate for a migration-aware approach. Um, this is where health systems are able to embed population movement central to the design of, of interventions. This means that we need to think about um, strategic opportunities for addressing health inequity um, through this lens. We know that by engaging with migration, we are going to improve the numbers of people that we reach in terms of our health interventions. It is going to mean that we are able to support treatment continuity, for example, for people with um, chronic conditions um, requiring lifelong treatment. Um, ultimately, this is going to have positive impacts on um, communicable disease control and further support um, movement towards global health targets. So without embedding migration in our health system's responses, um, I would argue that we are going to struggle to achieve global health targets. We need to better look at accountability. We need to better hold um, those who use politics um, and public rhetoric and racism and xenophobia and nationalism to make decisions. We need to work out who can be held accountable in what way. We know that non-binding agreements at the global level aren't helpful in terms of accountability mechanisms. Do we need to think about costing studies that will better show us what is effective in terms of, um, in terms of a, a public health intervention? Do we need to think about the ways in which um, we, we need to look at who becomes responsible for these issues that moves beyond binding and non-binding agreements. Um, we need to identify strategic opportunities, and by this I mean we need to make sure that we're not exceptionalising movement or making um, migration to be a, a particular um, issue that requires a special response. We need to be looking at existing um, approaches to improving access to healthcare for all, and we need to then be bringing migration and um, the rights of people on the move into those conversations. New initiatives that focus exclusively on non-nationals run the risk of rarefying and exceptionalising um, and give the opportunity for nation states to reimagine these movements as being about the fact that all who move all non-nationals require health care, for example. We need to look at building alliances. We need to build alliances both within government as a whole-of-government approach, but also um, more effectively between a range of governance actors. 
We need to think about who can do what within these spaces. What's the role of the state and with allies in the state versus the role of civil society? What does it mean if we have a um, private sector who benefit greatly from cheap migrant labor um, but are unwilling to invest in health? How do we build alliances across these that can help um, ensuring that we are working to address um, the you know, universal healthcare coverage, we are working to improve health for all. And within this, I would argue that we need to better understand research itself as a process of action. Engaged, slow research, there's a slow research movement, the importance of personal relationships um, in working with people involved in policy and service delivery are key. Because these issues are tense and difficult, we need to find ways to, to come together um, in ways that are built on trust, um, not only on, on kind of doing the research and the evidence, um, but also how can we engage with each other in ways that are respectful and understand the difficulties of the political terrain within which we're working. Finally, we need an action plan. Too often we make recommendations um, without actually providing guidance on what's needed. I would argue that action plans are very context specific um, and they need to be developed in different regions, in different, different nations, in different ways. I would argue quite strongly that we need to move away from a global governance approach to recognising the importance of regional, national and subnational responses. And finally, I would like to abuse my position and encourage you to engage with the Migration, Health and Development Research Initiative, Marjorie, which is a international um, network of individuals involved um, in, in research. Beyond the academy, um, it includes individuals from civil society, from UN agencies, governments, um, with a particular emphasis on earlier career people. Um, you can check out the website, um, and for those of you who are interested in migration and health, there are a range of resources. And this is an initiative that I think is an example of the need for alliance building of finding ways to support individuals to come together who are struggling in working in these contested political spaces um, to bring these issues together.